Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we are having a look at a fascinating if slightly mysterious piece of military aviation equipment. This is what's known as a Visual Approach Slope Indicator, or VASI. As the name suggests, these are used to give pilots a visual indication of whether they are maintaining the proper glide path during final approach. This particular example is a portable unit designed for use with helicopters and was manufactured by McGraw Edison in 1975. And that's about all I know about it. Despite our best efforts, neither myself nor any of my military historian friends have been able to find any reference to this device at all. It doesn't have a Canadian Forces catalog number or a NATO stock number. Nothing. We don't know when or even if this was adopted into the Canadian Armed Forces. Best we can figure, maybe it was a commercial sample or something that was intended for trials but never formally adopted just don't know. However, if any of you recognize this or have worked with one of them and know anything else about this device, please let me know and I will add that extra information in the description. In the meantime, however, I can show you exactly how this works, so why don't we dive right in. Now, while this particular unit is designed to be portable, typically VASI and other visual approach systems are permanently installed at the head of the runway. And while there are many different types of VASI installations, all work in a similar fashion, by projecting two or more differently colored beams of light, such that the color of that beam of light changes depending on whether the pilot is above, below, or on his proper glide path. A standard or classic VASI setup consists of two rows of light, one mounted right at the start of the runway and the other 7 meters or 23 feet behind it. Each light features a split filter and lens assembly that causes the light beam to appear either white or red depending on the pilot's angle relative to the proper glide path. If the pilot is below the glide path, both rows will appear white. If they are below, both will appear red, and if they are on the glide path, the upper row will appear red while the lower row will appear white. Pilots often memorize this arrangement using the mnemonic rhyme, white over white, you're high as a kite, red over white, you're all right, and red over red, you're dead. Typically, VASI installations are visible out to 8 kilometers or 5 miles during the day and 32 kilometers or 20 miles at night and provide obstruction clearance within plus or minus 10 degrees from the runway centerline and 7 kilometers or 4 miles away from the end of the runway. But while the standard VASI used to be the most common visual approach system installed at airports, it is now considered obsolete, having been deleted from the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO, Annex 14 on aerodromes in 1995. However, other versions of VASI are still in use. For example, the T-VASI consists of two groups of 10 lights arranged symmetrically on either side of the runway. Each group comprises a cross of four lateral and six longitudinal lights, such that if the pilot is too high, they see a white inverted T. If they are too low, they see a regular red T. And if they are on the glide path, they see a horizontal row of white lights. There is also a simpler version called the abbreviated, or ATVASI, which uses one set of ten lights on one side of the runway. There are also several variations of this system using 3, 4, 6, 12, or 16 light bars, which provide additional glide path options for large aircraft with high cockpits. 3, 4, and 6 light installations tend to be placed on one side of the runway, while 12 and 16 light installations are arranged symmetrically on either side of it. Moving on, tricolor VASI systems use a single light box with a filter that splits the light beam into red, green, and amber zones to indicate that the pilot is below, on, or above the glide path. These are commonly used in heliports, and indeed the McGraw-Edison unit we have here is a tricolor VASI. A variation on this system is the pulsating, or PVASI, which as the name implies, uses pulsating lights to make the pilot's approach angle easier to interpret. If they are too high, they will see a pulsating white light. If they are slightly too low, they will see a solid red light. If they are very low, they will see a pulsating red light. And if they are on the glide path, they will see a solid white light. But while VASI systems used to be the standard, increasingly they are being replaced by what is known as a Precision Approach Path Indicator, or PAPI. This consists of a single row of four lights mounted on one side of the runway and arranged such that if the pilot is too high, they will see four white lights. If they are slightly too high, they will see three white and one red light. If they are on the glide path, they will see two white and two red lights. If they are slightly low, they will see one white and three red lights. And if they are very low, they will see four red lights. Yeah! Now, Poppy systems have a number of advantages over VASI systems, providing more precise glide path information while being easier to install and maintain. 
However, they are more technically complex and expensive and visible out to shorter ranges, which is why Vasi systems are typically seen at smaller airports, while Poppy systems are seen at larger airports that are busier and have more complex terrain. Anyway, with all of that background out of the way, let's have a closer look at this unit and let me show you exactly how it works. This is the unit in its locked transport configuration with a canvas carrying handle on the top. On this side, we have instructions on how to set the glide slope angle, while on this side, we have further instructions plus all of our controls. But well, we'll get to those in a minute once we've set up the entire unit. And here we have three tubular legs held in this bracket at the top. These fit into these three angled holes on the bottom of the unit, as so, to form a tripod. However, that makes the unit too tall to fit in my photo booth, so I'll just leave them off for now. So to open this up, we undo these four latches around the top edge, then lift out and flip over the lid to reveal our projector head. The lid is symmetrical, so we can put it back down onto the base upside down and secure it in place with the latches. The projector is mounted on a base plate with a ball head and bubble level, and can be adjusted for both elevation, or glide slope, and azimuth, or approach direction, by turning these knobs. According to the instruction plate, the first step after assembling the tripod and securing the lid is to set the azimuth plate to zero and orient the zero mark towards the south using a compass. We then level the base plate by unlocking the ball head with this knob and using the bubble level. We then rotate the azimuth plate to the desired approach direction and lock it in place, then select our approach angle. Handily, this plate on the side includes a table of appropriate angles for air speeds from 80 to 140 knots at 400 feet and 1000 feet per second rates of descent. And we adjust that by turning this knob and using the scale below the projector. Now, according to the instruction plate, we must then confirm that our approach path is clear of obstructions. And we do this by using these sights on the right-hand side of the projector barrel. The vertical crosshair here represents the center of the beam, while the horizontal crosshair represents the bottom of the red, or below glide slope, zone. So we align the rear sight with the front sight and check to see if there are any power lines, buildings, trees, or other obstructions above the horizontal crosshair. And if there are, then either we adjust our approach angle or direction, or both. Next, we connect the projector up to our power source, which we do by removing the cover from this jack on the front panel and plugging in this cable coming off the back of the projector. This unit is designed to hold a 22 to 28 volt rechargeable battery internally. We can either recharge said battery or run the entire unit off an external power source via these two connectors. And as luck would have it, I have a 25 volt transformer that I can connect using alligator clips to power up the unit. To switch between off, battery, external power, and charging mode, we use this rotary selector switch. And back on the left side of the control panel, this potentiometer controls the brightness of the projector. Here you can see the tricolored beam projected by the unit, red for below glide path, green for on the glide path, and amber for above the glide path. Finally, these two switches allow us to use the projector to signal incoming aircraft. To do this, we hold down the authentication button while tapping the signal button. You will also notice there's a little lamp on the side which illuminates the azimuth and elevation scales during night use. Right, so let's disassemble the projector itself. This is actually surprisingly tricky. First, we unlock this wire latch by pulling it back and flipping it out of this slot on the back. Then we pull or twist off the rear of the housing. Strangely, this isn't threaded, it's just held on by friction with an O-ring and is a very tight fit. So I will just use a strap wrench to remove it, and off it comes. In the back we have our light bulb with a parabolic reflector to collimate its light into a linear beam. And in the front we have our tricolor filter and some additional lenses. Finally, to access the internal circuitry, we undo these screws around the edges of the two front panels, and they both come off as so. The bottom panel has this bracket for holding the battery, unfortunately missing in this example, while the top panel holds all the controls. And inside this compartment, we can see a voltage regulator and two large resistors, which are part of the battery charging system. And I know this because there is a handy little schematic on the inside of the top panel. And that, dear viewers, is how a portable helicopter Vasi system works. Now, as I said before, if any of you have any further information on the official designation of this unit, when it entered service and when it left, things like that, please let me know. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more fascinating aviation equipment and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.